Hello, and welcome back to Beyond Networks, the evolution of living systems. Last time, we talked about the modern synthetic theory of evolution, the synthesis that never was. At least it tried. It did manage to unify genetics and Darwinism. But beyond that remained a sort of fractionated assemblage of models. And instead of a synthesis, it was really more of a theoretical constriction that said, that excluded a lot of different phenomena that were um, uh, of interest to evolutionary biologists before and focused uh, exclusively on population level processes of genetic evolution. It is more of a historical narrative or a cultural tradition in evolutionary biology. And uh, so it has to be seen as a moving target with its exact content and limitations unclear. So, Against this background, we want to revisit today the idea of how the problem of how can we integrate uh, development, rejoin it with evolutionary theory. And so the story begins with uh, Victor Hamburger's contribution to the 1980 volume, The Evolutionary Synthesis, and his claim that we need to reopen the black box of development. He was criticized very heavily by a student of the Pchanskis called Wallace, who said, we don't need to reopen this black box because evolution is completely irrelevant. But criticisms were mounting at that time already, um, and they had been coming much earlier. One of the earliest was this uh, causal completeness principle that Ron Amundsen attributes to either Richard Goldschmidt, Walter Garstang, Gavin de Beer, or Conrad Howe Waddington, who were all evolutionary minded embryologists or um, embryologically minded evolutionists. And this principle, of course, we've encountered it several times. It says, in order to achieve a modification in adult form, evolution must modify the embryological processes responsible for that form. It's logical. Therefore, an understanding of evolution requires an understanding of development. But this is a declaration. So we need, first of all, proof that development is really important. And then we need a way to integrate it into the existing theory in some way. And so several ways uh, of doing this were developed. Early criticisms were very ineffectual and were uh, refuted by people who considered themselves within the modern synthesis. Um, for example, Richard Goldschmidt became a real sort of bogeyman for the, the evolutionists. Um, some of them were quite influential, if not um, with the core of the uh, modern synthetic crowd. Uh, for example, uh, Waddington's uh, epigenetic landscape, his idea of an epigenotype that you have to intercalate between this level of the geno genotype and the phenotype, which are the only levels that exist in modern synthesis theory. And from Waddington's sort of uh, legacy, several sort of strands were built that led to the modern field, the modern discipline of evolutionary developmental biology, or evo evo. This is the field where I come from historically as well, where my empirical research was done. And so it's a pleasure to use this lecture today to very briefly go through a bunch of models and contributions of development or phenomena associated with development that may or may not be important for evolution. So let's have a look at those and see what they are and what they're actually contributing to the discussion about evolutionary theory. And this story uh, starts in Vienna with uh, Rupert Riedel, who in the early 70s uh, devises what he calls the systems theory of evolution, which he publishes in German in 1975, in the book, The Ordnung des Lebendigen, and in uh, the excellent English tradition, uh, translation of this book by Dick Jeffries, The Order in Living Organisms. Read the English version, it's much more accessible. Riedel himself summarized all his arguments in a 1977 review. Um, and so let's just see two very important uh, concepts from that structuralist sort of, um, al almost process structuralist, uh, approach to evolution. One sort of uh, concept that Riedel introduced that survived is called burden, and it's the idea um, that the internal structure of organisms influences uh, 
adaptive dynamics and explains why certain aspects of the organisms just simply can't evolve any further. He writes, all systems functionally essential and highly interconnected or burdened will be found to be genetically tightly interdependent and in principle unalterable. So with this, he explains the stability of the body plans that came up during the Cambrian explosion and haven't much changed since then. And of course, this is very similar to Wimsatt's idea of generative entrenchment that we've encountered very early on in this course. So older parts of the system are just harder to, to, to change because more other parts depend on them. My favorite uh, Riedelian concept here, theoretical concept, is the imitatory epigenotype. Um, where he basically observes that um, you need to have some sort of alignment of the epigenetic uh, interdependencies. So the way the system uh, can vary and the functional interdependencies, the way the system needs to vary to be uh, adapted through natural selection. And this is a, a theme that will come back over and over again. So uh, Riedel is, is claiming here that the architecture of the organism is biasing variation in a way that makes it easier um, to evolve. So this is a question of evolvability, a very early treatment of that question. In English speaking world, Riedel wasn't really noticed very much. And the origins of Evo Devo lay more with uh, uh, Stephen Jay Gould, especially his 19, 1977 book, um, Ontogeny and Phylogeny, in which he discusses the importance of heterochrony and neoteny in evolution. So basically, he's in general, he's discussing the dissociability of different developmental processes and how they structure, again, biased variation or constrained variation in evolution. And this is used as an argument that you need evolution, uh, development to explain evolution. Of course, uh, two years later, he publishes together with Richard Lewinton his famous Spandrels paper against adaptationist, sort of extreme adaptationist views and the idea that the structure of the organism can impose const absolute constraints on the evolution um, of uh, uh, living systems. So these early sort of criticisms of the modern synthesis are all about uh, sort of constraining or biasing variation. So at the same time, of course, we've been over this already, you have process structuralism in the form of Goodwin um, and also Albert. Uh, per Albert was an integral part of early Evo Devo and George Oster. So this is a different type of theory. It is formal, okay? It uses mathematical models to argue concepts. And also it's different from Stephen Jay Gould and even Riedel in a way that has never been really accepted in Evo Devo. It always remained marginalized. But it was a, a serious and a structured and a philosophically profound attempt at uh, an argument why developmental processes are important. And of course, it's centered uh, around this idea that development provides this sort of map of the possible for selection to act on. Again, this is related to the structure of variation. And so that seems to be a theme. We need development to explain the structure of variation, the sources of variation. Um, as opposed to the consequences. This may be the sort of the birth, uh, birthday of Evo Devo, a conference in Berlin, the Dahlem Conference on Evolution and Development in 1981, and an edited book by uh, John Tyler Bonner uh, in 1982 that comes out and summarizes uh, contributions by the people who attended, but also others. So here is Eric Davidson, and here's Stuart Kaufman, surprise guest at the foundation uh, of Evo Devo. So uh, this really kick-started a series of uh, efforts to define what development contributes to evolution. And it led to other meetings, which led to other sort of proceedings like this one uh, about developmental constraint. It has a very interesting sort of set of authors, if you look at it. It has Stuart Kaufman again, Para Alberg, Brian Goodwin, uh, but also uh, uh, Landy, Raup, uh, and Maynard Smith, some really traditional um, evolutionary biologists. And they say, a developmental constraint is a bias on the production of variant phenotype or a limitation on phenotypic variability caused by the structure, character, composition, or dynamics of the evolution, of the developmental system, sorry. So this is not really a problem uh, for, for 
traditional evolutionary theory. All you have to do if, is you have to sort of limit the amount of variation in certain ways or bias the, the variation that natural selection can work on. And I doubt that many modern evolutionary geneticists would actually have a problem with this. And it's quite straightforward to introduce it to models of, uh, um, of uh, natural selection. You just have to introduce the observed or speculated uh, structure of, of bias structure of variation. So this is all hunky-dory. I mean, the, the um, attempts at integrating development become more forceful. Some of the evolutionary synthesis people are on board, like Lewontin and Maynard Smith are even interested in this. Others, like uh, Meyer, become more and more um, you know, narrow-minded and stringent against this. And then a really big thing occurs. And that is one of the biggest failures of prediction in evolutionary theory. Okay, it's got to do with the um, discovery of what we now call the genetic toolkit. And so before um, this discovery, people like Dobchansky or Meyer would uh, bet a lot of money on the following prediction, okay? They said common characters among different species must be the result of adaptive convergence because these species are way too far apart. There's way too much time between them, but there could be uh, sort of an, an intrinsic um, uh, conserv conservation. So they predicted that you would find no homologous genes among really distantly related creatures. And of course, in 1984, with the discovery of the homeobox and the discovery very specifically that it didn't just occur in transcription factors in flies, but also the same motive, the same binding domain occurred in proteins in frogs, as shown by Eddie D. Robertis that year. This was a major, major surprise and a major sensation. And over the next few years, what turned out is that not just ho uh, homeobox genes, Hox genes, but also other selector genes, ILS, PAC6 for eye development, Tinman, NKX uh, genes for heart, and all the main signaling pathways were highly conserved across the animal kingdom, from flies to humans. And so this was something that the evolutionary synthesis theory couldn't really explain at all. And it seemed to indicate a much higher degree of con conservation of developmental processes, as predicted by Riedel, of course, with his concept of burden. It changed a lot. It was a huge surprise, and it allowed new thoughts to occur. For example, a completely new reconceptualization of homology. Historically, so the concept that, that people like Ernst Meyer would use is called the historical concept of homology. It is very similar to Owen's original concept that I've already introduced earlier, but it is, it, it, it eliminates any structuralist sort of, you know, organ off any type of function, you know, it, any structuralist arguments. It simply says a, a homologous a uh, trait is a feature in two or more taxa that is derived from the same or a corresponding feature of their common ancestor, purely historical definition. But of course, you have to infer the ancestry. And so you are relying on structural, morphological, whatever traits, uh, criteria to, to establish the ancestral relationships in the first place and the phylogenetic relationships, which was another problem that uh, traditional um, uh, modern synthesis theory we was facing, and new ways, cladistics and others were developed at that time to overcome those problems, which also had something to do with the origin of Ivo Divo, but not with what we're talking about here. So because of this fact that, you know, developmental processes are much more conserved than you would think, you can come up with an alternative uh, definition here. And Gunter Wagner just uh, did just that. Uh, in the 80s and introduced the, the, what he called the developmental or biological concept of homology. Uh, she writes about in, in 1989 here. And in his definition, homologies are now reflections of shared developmental processes, okay? A very different uh, view um, that explicitly involves structuralist, the structure of developmental processes. It explains why special and serial homologs are the same thing. So basically, if you look at these insects, we were talking about them before, um, you can see that the butterfly has sort of the ancestral arrangement of two forewings and two hindwings here. Both are used for flying, while 
uh, diptera, flies and mosquitoes, have four wings that are for flying and the hind wings are reduced to these hull tiers, little bulbs that are used uh, to keep balance. While um, beetles have uh, turned their four wings into uh, cover, protective covers for their wings called elytra, and they use the hind wings for flying. So homology here is defined by, uh, you know, the four wings are homologous, not function, but the position, the relative position, structural sort of um, uh, uh, criteria. So that's one thing. The other thing is that obviously the four wings and the hind wings are somehow homologous, that's called serial homology. And this sort of developmental concept of homology explains this because it says basically that these organs are all based on similar developmental processes that generate them, okay? So of course, this wouldn't be possible if you didn't have this sort of fact of the conservation of developmental processes to begin with. So it is a new theoretical uh, uh, sort of view on homology. And I think it's one of the, the, the strongest and best contributions of um, Evo Devo to evolutionary theory so far that is based on this new evidence that came out of early molecular Evo Devo and the, the work on the genetic toolkit. So from that, of course, and we've already talked about this, Gunther uh, develops this, this theory of variational structuralism, his genetic theory of homology, where he says there are specific networks that are uh, sort of modular and they are uh, responsible for um, defining the identity of homologous characters. So these similarities in the developmental processes are because of the underlying genetic architecture. I've criticized this already. We'll come back to that a little bit in the next module again, um, discussions about homology. You also get things like uh, Miller, Wagner, and uh, Stuart Newman's uh, epigenetic innovation theory. We've been over this as well with their sort of, they're trying to state conditions under which you can get <clears throat> innovation, which is defined in terms of the homology that we just had. So if you think about it in the terms of uh, developmental homology or biological homology, you can say that a novelty is uh, a character that is based on a, a developmental process that is substantially altered or completely novel. Okay, so you have to explain where this, this come from and you need to take all kinds of things into account like shifts in the functional pressures of, of, of natural selection, initiating conditions, but also internal sort of uh, effects like threshold effects and self-organization in nonlinear developmental processes. Okay, so then of course, apart from homology, talking about innovation, we're already in this discussion uh, about evolvability. There are some main themes in Evo Devo. There, there are many, many themes, but certainly homology and evolvability are um, central. And also they're, they're not independent. They're sort of related to each other, okay? So we're talking about innovation. We're talking about the potential to innovate. We're talking about evolvability. Well, you can define evolvability in different ways, one of which um, here um, provided by David Hull is completely compatible with modern synthesis biology. It says, evolvability is the ability of a population to respond to selection and it depends on the amount of standing variation that you have already in the population. Heritability is a measure of evolvability. Basically, you can use standard um, population genetics models to, to treat this sort of evolvability. But there's another kind of evolvability defined in the famous Wagner and Altenberg paper in 1996 that we've encountered already. Uh, and it's simply the genome's ability to produce adaptive variants. So close to Riedel's imitatory epigen epigenotype again, it's sort of, it's hard to grasp these concepts, right? Oh, it's, it's difficult. So verbal descriptions. A measure, this is a measure of the accessibility of the phenotypic neighborhood, okay? Or more precisely, the ability to produce potentially adaptive variants, okay? And there's a third way in which to uh, define it, um, which was first uh, brought up by, by John Maynard Smith, actually. It's the propensity to evolve novel structures. Maynard Smith develops this uh, in the context of thinking about major transitions and innovation. And uh, Andreas Wagner uh, recently has um, suggested to rename this as innovability, because it's really something different uh, from um, evolvability in the context of adaptive. Um, variation. So evolvability is a central topic in Evo Devo. It depends on their theories about what it depends on, the covariance of related traits. Again, going back to Riedel, 
the imitatory epigenotype, modularity of the genotype phenotype map. I'll have something to say about modularity in the next um, module uh, of this lecture. We haven't actually talked about it too much yet. Um, variational properties um, or developmental constraints, if you like it that way. And then the canalization or robustness of uh, developmental processes. Once again, I don't want to go into the details of these arguments, but these are sort of theoretical arguments that, you know, evol evolvability is important. It's a feature of the sort of variation you produce, and it depends on these sort of factors, okay? So there's a theory here. And in fact, some people think it's really, really important. So here's a beautiful paper. I, I show this in its full glory because it's, it says evol evolvability is the proper focus of evolutionary developmental biology. I love it when somebody writes a paper where they tell other people what they should be studying. But no doubt, um, Evo Devo is uh, about evolvability, and that's a really central theme in the discipline. And it also plays a large role in this, in this last sort of model. I mean, I'm, I'm sh only showing you a tiny, tiny number of models that come from uh, Evo Devo. There's a lot of people I apologize to right here that I can't mention because there's so many different models and theories that come out of it. But they're all similar, so these are pretty representative. Uh, the ones that I'm showing you here in the terms of the, the, the characteristics that we'll discuss in a minute. So this is the uh, theory of facilitated evolution, which was published in PNAS uh, in 2005, and also in a very interesting book, The Plausibility of Life, um, Resolving Darwin's Paradoxes, the subtitle is, if, if I remember properly, where the authors, Mark Kirchner uh, and John Gerhardt, uh, two different uh, uh, biochemists, developmental biologists, cell biologists are thinking about the evolution of cellular and developmental processes and they define these core processes that are sort of very surprisingly highly conserved again, major insight of Evo Devo, major surprise, and uh, are saying that evolution is working by tweaking how, when, and what combinations these sort of standard processes are employed. So sort of, you know, that modularity, dissociability idea again, that was also already in, in Stephen Jay Gould, going back to, to the 1930s, idea of the 1930s. So what they define as facilitated variation is sort of uh, processes that, that maximize the amount of viable phenotypic variation in a given environment, okay? And this maximization happens because of certain characteristics of developmental processes. One is, their exploratory nature, they're, they're sort of adaptive in the sense that physiology is adaptive, so they can, they can sort of find the right way to do something in an unexpected environment. They have weak linkage. This is exactly, uh, again, dissociability um, and compartmentalization, which is modularity um, of, of processes. Okay, so you, you, you are realizing there are a lot of theories about a lot of topics, but a lot of them overlap in many ways, and none of them use the same concepts. It's the problem. Okay, it's very confusing. It's really frustrating to try and get a grip. If you try to get a grip of all the theories that have come out of models that have come out of Evo Devo, it's crazy. Okay, so then last but not least, and um, I cannot avoid talking about this, is the infamous debate about regulatory evolution. Here is a funny picture of the two, one, one, two of the main, main pro, uh, uh, proponents of this fight, Greg Ray on one side with a t-shirt uh, called Exxon Schmexxon, and Jerry Coyne on the other um, with a t-shirt that says, I'm no sissy. And um, the debate was about frequent and very sort of broad claims that came from Evo Devo that uh, mutations in cis regulatory elements were the true driving force of phenotypic evolution. These arguments came out of our arguments uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, um, based on Eric Davidson was involved and Britain were involved in, in uh, sort of arguments about regulatory networks and how they were really important for development. And then the discovery that we share 99% of our um, genes with chimpanzees. So uh, in, in the lack of sort of a change in the number of genes, what must have happened is that the interactions between the genes got rewired. So this idea had been around for a while, but Evo Devo, with its sort of discovery of these very conserved developmental genes and forced this sort of arguments. And people like Sean Carroll and others started claiming that phenotypic evolution is exclusively based on um, mutations in cis-regulatory interactions. And they claimed 
that this would result in a new theory of genetic evolution. Okay, so this is the, the, the most famous debate that we've had in our field. Okay, about theory, a new theory of evolution. Okay, this is it's crazy, it's crazy. So here, I love this quote. This is, um, only a Viennese can say this. This is Viennese physicist Wolfgang Pauli. And when he reviewed a paper, the only comment he wrote on it was, you are not even wrong. This discussion is completely ludicrous, okay? So, well, there is one debate. So Jerry Coyne at times completely denied the importance of cis-regulatory um, mutations, which is crazy. By now we have plenty of examples, proof of principle that um, cis-regulatory mutations are important. But the opposite claim that cis-regulatory um, regulation is the most important driving force is also crazy. Well, you know, where the, imagine you have a regulatory network, a, a dynamic process based on a regulatory network. They, no matter where the mutation occurs, it will affect the regulatory dynamics. There's no other way, okay? So whether a mutation occurs in a cis-regulatory element or uh, the main sort of uh, uh, coding sequence of a gene, or as other people pointed out, there's all kinds of splice sites that can be mutated and all kinds of other regulatory targets. Uh, Adam Wilkins and uh, uh, Claudio Alonso pointed this out. So this is crazy. I mean, evolution would work, will work with, uh, with mutations that work, you know, they occur wherever. And of course, depending on how they affect the, the, the process, the, the regulatory network, they will have different uh, effect. So yes, there may be subtle differences and we, we may, if we had a theory about how changes in regulatory networks affect um, uh, phenotypes, then we would have to build that in, but we don't. I mean, you just basically have to look at each uh, individual case, look at the network that you're actually studying and the effects will be very context dependent. This is one of the main points of this, this lecture. So basically, Having a general theory here doesn't help you at all. That's one absurd thing about this discussion. So you just have to go and look. Uh, depending on your system, the mutations that actually mattered in evolution may occur here or there. I mean, it depends, right? Always. And the other bizarre thing is the way they tried to prove this is, is that, so um, um, David Stern and colleagues went and, and sort of counted the number uh, in the literature of <laughs> cis regulatory versus other mutations and there was a debate about you know whether what was more important based on the number of mutations in the literature which is completely crazy there's a confirmation bias because you only look at the the, the, the things you've already um discovered and also the number is completely irrelevant you could have one mutation that's extremely important and a lot of them that aren't really that important in evolution so this this whole debate is just frustrating it's frustrating and it shows you that sometimes there is just not a lot of theory to go on here, okay? So there is no sort of philosophical consideration of what is really important. Otherwise, these people would have noticed that it's all context dependent. It depends on your system that you're looking at and the history of that system. So if you have um, different mutations in different places, it'll be different from system to system. It's, it's, it's completely absurd to, to, to ex expect anything else. Okay, cis regulatory interactions, changes are important, and so are. Uh, changes in uh, any other place in the genome, as long as they affect the developmental dynamics somehow. Okay, end of discussion. This discussion got Evo Devo onto the front page of the New York Times and into a lot of trouble because sort of uh, creationists came and said, oh, you know, evolutionary biologists don't know how evolution works. While what's really uh, discussed here is nothing, it's really an absurd differences. It's Within the same perspective, it's a, a theory of genetic evolution. You may have to change your parameters a little bit and you have to work in details of the structure of your developmental network that we're working at. But this is completely context dependent. The effect of these mutations will be completely context dependent, okay? So you have to look case by case. This drove me crazy. One of the most unnecessary and most famous discussions in our field, completely fruitless. Nobody profited anything from this sort of theoretical discussion, by the way, and we don't have a new theory of evolution because of it. So let's sort of, after this really quick tour, let's sort of uh, look back at some of the issues with theory in Evo Devo. Um, so you may have noticed that the theoretical arguments and models that I've presented really quickly now, you may have been really confused because they are extremely diverse in terms of what they are trying to explain, first of all. 
evolvability, regulatory evolution, constraints, homology, innovations, and even more. I haven't even touched on the issue of developmental plasticity. I'm not ignoring it. We'll come back to it in the next module. I just sort of, I didn't have any energy or time anymore to put it in right here, but it's also there. Okay, models um, that actually caught on in EvoDevo, unlike um, process structuralism, which you formalize, are all, without exception, all of them, verbal and qualitative only. It's very frustrating if you go, you know, you think about the, epi, uh, the imitatory epigenotype and then these sort of exploratory processes and, and then terms of modularity, dissociability, compartmentalization, they all mean more or less the same, but because they're sort of really, you know, vaguely defined, it's really hard to relate them to each other and to relate these different isolated models with each other. So the relation between these models remains sort of difficult to define because they are only verbal. Okay, and so there, there is a certain utility to verbal modeling like this, but, but you know, I mean, there are some problems with it as well. So one other big problem is it is either obvious in, in case of the regulatory evolution example or, or the developmental constraints, how you integrate this into traditional evolutionary theory, or it's still entirely unclear with all the rest. These homology theories that are based on evolutionary processes, evolvability, as long as we don't know how to integrate um, development into traditional theory in the first place. And this may not be the point, let's get back to that. You know, we've talked about the reproducer perspective and maybe, you know, there are different perspectives here that cannot be integrated because they're asking different questions, okay? So, but, you know, it's seen as a problem by many people that the integration of most of Evo Devo into existing evolutionary theory is, is elusive, it's a problem. And a lot of people are blaming Evo Devo for that. And then, I mean, you may have noticed over the last uh, 20 minutes that in this field, we just love to reinvent the wheel. Think about facilitated variation. There is nothing new in this theory, but even early theories, they, they are going back to ideas that, you know, Waddington, you read the strategy of the gene, a lot of the evolvability sort of research program is already in there and nothing has happened since then. You go further back even, you know, uh, to, to old um, sort of themes, uh, to the 19th century ideas of, of integrating development and inheritance. And so we're coming back to these old topics in new ways with new toolkits uh, experimentally, and also new thinking toolkits. But not much is happening. Instead, we're sort of having a new theory of modularity, a new theory of evolvability, and a new theory of homology every few years. You know, there are exceptions. I think Günter Wagner's um, um, developmental theory of, of homology is, is a truly original and really strong contribution to evolutionary theory. We'll, we'll talk about Andreas Wagner's contribution um, to the uh, relationship between uh, robustness and innovation. Also very, very original, interesting contribution, a little outside Evo Devo and more in uh, evolutionary systems biology. So um, there are original contributions here, but um, they're really, you know, rare and they're, you know, I mean, you have to find them in this sort of jungle of different theories that have been put out there and are being put out year by year, new, you know, another wheel reinvented basically. It's a little frustrating. So from that, we have two problems. First of all, from outside, um, a lot of evolutionary biologists, they don't even consider uh, Evo Devo a proper scientific discipline. And even um, uh, members of Evo Devo have a sort of identity crisis every once in a while. And Evo Devo is often accused of not contributing to evolutionary theory, but aren't we sort of missing? I don't know if we're missing the point. So let's look at this a little bit closer. First, let's look at the sort of what Evo Devo actually is. It's really hard to pin down. So here is the earliest textbook uh, by Brian Hall, 1999, Evolutionary Developmental Biology. And it says, evolutionary developmental biology strives to forge a unification ha, of genomic developmental organismal population and natural selection approaches to evolutionary change. It draws from development, evolution, paleontology, molecular and systematic biology, but it has its own set of questions, approaches and methods. So the second part's fine, you know, I'm fine with that. We saw some of the questions, the topics, um, we haven't, you know, because this is a theory course, not talked about um, methods very much, but okay, we're fine with that. But the first part, is it really, I mean, if it's trying to forge a unification, then it hasn't done much in that direction since 1999, I'm sorry, we failed. It's a problem, okay? I don't know if it's a problem, but you know, Brian um, should think it's a problem. So here's Denis Duboul uh, in a little review from 2010, um, 
saying that Evo Devo is just a portfolio of concepts. Its frontiers, I guess he means boundaries, but frontiers sounds better, are not clearly defined, okay? Evo Devo research, I love this quote, extends from simply PCRing a trendy gene from a weird animal up to the most sophisticated molecular genetic approaches dealing with the evolution of gene function and regulation. He's a molecular biologist, so all of Evo Devo is just molecular genetics. The problem will come back. Okay, so he thinks this is a really broad definition, but, but his definition is very narrow-minded, only molecular biology. And so um, he says, okay, although experiments always happen within the, the, the general uh, context of homology, so for him, homology is sort of the main, um, molecular homology mainly, because of this toolkit, you know. So this is a very traditional view of, of Evo Devo, um, but it says, okay, so it's not a unified discipline at all. Okay, is this a problem? I don't know. So if you want, like Brian Hall, a unification, it is a problem. Because if, you, if that's what you want, we've completely, utterly failed. Point, period, done. Okay, but if that's not the point, maybe we could have another look at, at, at the discipline and, and, and sort of interpret it in a different way. And so I love this view, um, which was uh, proposed by philosopher Rasmus Winter, looking very summary for someone called Winter in this picture, uh, based on a idea uh, first proposed by historian of science Peter Callis and books in the background and that's the idea of a trading zone. So the lack of unity does not have to imply a lack of maturity or a lack of you know it's not a problem necessarily because Evo Devo you can it can be seen as a trading zone incorporating a variety of discipline styles and paradigms negotiating with each other and that's because it has to integrate so many different views, perspectives, and you know, it's a complex um, sort of topic that it's studying. I love this idea. The bazaar of Evo Devo. Why does it have to be unified? Logical positivism, I told you early on in this course, is dead. We do not need to unify all of science, okay? So in a perspectivist view, this is not, this is great. Trading zones are great. Okay, a trading zone is an especially rich nexus of different perspectives. And I love this. So from, from this point of view, it's not a problem that we don't have a unified grand theory out of Evo Devo. But in other, other ways, there are problems with the models I just introduced to you. So um, before I get to those, just a quick reiteration. Flogging the dead horse, I know, but what Evo Devo is really trying to do. So it doesn't have to be unified and the perspectives it is contributing to evolutionary biology also do not necessarily have to fit into traditional evolutionary theory because there are different perspectives here. One is an adaptationist perspective that says individuals don't evolve, populations do. Species are effects of the evolution of populations. It doesn't even have to be adaptations. You can have nowadays a lot of neutral theories uh, at the population level, actually. I think this is a bit of a misnomer that comes out of the historical approach that Ron Amundsen takes. And a structuralist, you can replace that with Evo Devoist, Evo Deviant, Evo Diva. I don't know what the name is. Uh, they say individuals don't evolve but ontogenies do. Characters are effects of the evolution of ontogenies. These are different perspectives on evolution. They don't have to fit together. So Evo Devo doesn't necessarily have to just contribute a little puzzle piece of that formal theory of the modern synthesis that never existed and never will exist. Okay, it's fine to have more uh, models that are just perspectives on evolution that are important nevertheless. But there is a major problem with uh, Evo Devo that I want to complain about before I stop. And that is, first of all, theoretical evolutionary work is only a tiny, tiny fraction of Evo Devo. So 6% of papers published in Evo Devo journals compared to 22.2 in ecology and evolution. This is data from Giuseppe Fusco's really nice paper from 2015 about theory and practice in evolution. Uh, Evo Devo, sorry. So why is there so little, you know, why is there so little interest? That, that, Main problem is that Evo Diva, in, to a large extent, is just developmental biology. Maybe it's comparative developmental biology, but it's developmental biology. Okay, most researchers are developmental molecular geneticists that work in weird non model organisms. That's it. They don't do evolution, really. They do comparative molecular embryology, which is a form of evolutionary biology. Okay, fine. But they're not looking at sort of the way that evolutionary processes work. Okay. 
there is an underappreciation of good theoretical work in the field. And that's, that's a really big problem, okay? So it goes against mathematical modeling, but it's even worse for good philosophical theory. Okay, there's not much sympathy for that. And a lot of the work just doesn't care about theory. A lot of the people in the field don't care about field. Uh, in the theory. And on the one hand, that's sort of, you know, we have to blame the experimentalists because there's a lack of interest. And also, unfortunately, nowadays, a lack of education about philosophical and mathematical issues. Biologists are trained as, you know, high power technicians nowadays. They're not, they're getting a philosophical doctor, but they, they're not trained in the philosophy of science or in mathematical modeling by default, which is a huge problem, I think, because it makes it difficult to connect and uh, experimentalists have difficulties understanding um, not just the details, but even the purpose of modeling work, um, or even uh, worse, uh, good philosophical theory. And then the other problem is, though, that you know, there is a lot of theory, especially if the sort of philosophically inclined type in Evo Devo, that is just, I'm writing quite useless. It's really, really bad. Okay, it doesn't help us. Okay, to make progress in the field at all. And so I want to look at that. It has something to do with this sort of verbal armchair philosophy that's very predominant in the field. And some really, really fundamental misunderstandings about the nature of how we create knowledge in evolutionary biology. This will be the topic of the next lecture where we look at the attempt to extend the modern synthesis that never was. As usual, Thanks for listening, and I hope you tune in again next time. Bye now.